let's get going. We got some good cases this morning. And I think most of these are, most of them are fairly characteristic of stuff that you could get, see again on the exam. Morning, I can do this one. Okay, great. So this, I thought, looked like a benign neoplasm. Um, it had a connection to the epidermis. And it's made up of a lot of, it looks like keratinocytes, but they look a little bit different than um, the keratinocytes that we normally see. Um, I also saw some like ductal yeah. differentiation with some African secretion. In Let's some hold on a second before you go too much further. You said what you normally see, or you're kind of referring probably just to like the squamous epithelium in the epidermis, right? Correct. So basically, you're you're what you're saying is benign neoplasm with epithelial differentiation, which is is absolutely correct. And then you started describing that. Um, so let's go to higher magnification. This area over here. So what kind of differentiation do you think we're looking at right here? Um, I would call this poroid differentiation. Okay. That's one possibility. They also look a little bit like clear cells. They are a little clear. I totally agree with you on that. I think you said you saw some ductal differentiation. Um, I was trying to find that. I, there's kind of what looks like maybe an infundibulum of a hair follicle. Maybe that's what I was thinking of. What about the periphery? These cells versus these. Um, it looks like there's kind of, would you call that like palisading or like a thickened basement membrane? That, that, yeah, I agree. I think there's a little bit of that. There, these are more basaloid here and these are more clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, does poroid usually give you more than one cell type? Usually. No, typically that's very like monomorphic. Yeah, good. So it'd be, it'd be a little funny to see this kind of sort of differentiation that's more kind of basaloid out here and more germinative in a way, and then these clear cells. So um, there is, you can get a clear cell component of poroid, but poroid lesions are usually more very, very monomorphous, like you said, and they're, they're cuboidal and basophilic. It's a little unusual to get the clear component of a poroid lesion. Um, but that's in the differential. But what else is in the besides that? So you could think of something like a clear cell acanthoma, but that typically doesn't create like this, you know, huge, huge tumor. Tumor. Exactly. Well, what does that actually look like? Clear cell acanthoma. It looks a lot like psoriasis, actually. Yeah. Good. Excellent. It's like a little small papule. Um, that looks like psoriasis. And when you see it sort of clinically, there's these little skin color to pink papules and you'll see normal skin. And then you'll see this little small zone that's got this, it's not classic like psoriasis. It's usually a little bit the more bulbous epithelial proliferations than psoriasis, but it's got some overlying parakeratosis with neutrophil. So it does look a little bit like psoriasis, but you're exactly right. You would never make a large endophytic, mostly neoplasm like this. So what else would you um, think? You could also think of, especially with the peripheral palisading, like a trichelomoma or even a basal uh, cell. Yeah, so maybe trichelomal differentiation. So, so instead of necessarily going down the sweat gland differentiation, maybe more follicular. Good. Now you said trichelomoma. Um, tell me a little bit about that. What what's that? What's trichelomal mean? What's that actual word translate into in English? Is it like the, the hair root sheath? Yeah, hair sheath, exactly. So you remember when you're in your normal anatomy of the hair follicle, you have internal root sheath, external root sheath. And if you look at that, you get those cells at the periphery that are kind of at the very outer part of the hair follicle. And this is mostly the inferior portion of the hair follicle. And then you get the clear cells internally. And then you get the little areas that you start getting the trichohyaline and then the 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 formation of the hair shaft and, and all those different kind of layers, which we don't necessarily have to go into. But this is the differentiation that you see on the outer root sheath. 
and this clear material, what do you think this is actually? Is it glycogen? Yes, it's glycogen, excellent. So, and note, look at the morphology of this. It sort of almost looks like a wart, doesn't it? You've got this yes. hyperplasia over here. In fact, some people call these tricholinal verrucas. Uh, that's what Dr. Ackerman used to call them in the old days. Um, trichloma is fine. So, but that's actually what this is. It's a trichloma, uh, trichloma or trichloma verruca, whichever name you want to use. Now, this area over here is probably just a zone of maybe some cystic degeneration in the lesion. I don't think this really is apocrine differentiation here. I think it's just an area kind of necrosed a little bit and it's got some pseudo cystic morphology to it. Um, is there any significance about this lesion? If you saw this histologically, well, on a board examination, could they possibly ask you a second order question regarding this entity? Um, is it like it's association with, I can't think of the, the syndrome right now, but um, they get like multiple trichelomomas and basal yeah. cells. Uh, not necessarily basal cells, just so they get multiple trichelomomas. It's one, it's associated with the Cowden syndrome. Cowden so syndrome, okay. You know, because they do like to ask things like that. They might show you this and expect you to get the diagnosis pretty quickly. And then they'd ask you what syndrome is associated with this. And sometimes they'll even go far enough to ask you what gene has been associated with it, if it's been described. So uh, just make sure you know that. Okay, very good. Excellent. Okay, this is one they probably, if they ask it on the exam, they're not going to like get too detailed on it, but at least you need to kind of have some, uh, be able to get a general diagnostic into the cat diagnostic category here. Hi, good morning. I'll take this one. Um, yeah. So it looks like we have an excisional biopsy of a largely um, Dermal lesion looks to be extending down into the sub Q. Um, yeah. When I looked at this one, it looked very infiltrative um, and looking at a bit higher power. Um, what do you mean to say infiltrative, by the way, just so I'll know what you're thinking there. What do you mean by that? Well, I guess um, like all of this collagen, like collagen trapping and like going down in the sub Q kind of just looks like all of those cells are kind of moving into this area rather than being um, like a solid tumor, I guess is what I'm thinking. Rather than being well circumscribed, you've got cells that are uh, present between and among collagen bubbles out here at the periphery. Um, you've got involvement of the subcutaneous fat, re almost replacement of the subcutaneous fat with this neoplastic cells. Uh, so those are signs of malignancy. So you're right. <laughs> Um, just infiltrative, um, just think of it in terms of poor circumscription, you know, lesion. Yeah, I guess that would be a better way to describe it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, good. So you think so it's I'm... plasm, correct? Correct. Yes. Would you favor benign or malignant? Malignant, yeah. certainly. Yeah, yeah, it's got that that pattern you just mentioned. Um, it's also pretty big. I mean, this is an excisional biopsy that takes up the whole field of the low power scanning image here. So it's probably a you know, couple, maybe a couple of centimeters. It's it's pretty big lesion. Um, it's not well circumscribed. You know, it's got a it's round, but you say, well, gosh, it's it's down in the subcutaneous fat here. It, it's poorly circumscribed over here. So yeah, it's got all the features of malignancy at low magnification. And then, what kind of differentiation do you think it's exhibiting? So that was a bit harder um, looking into it. So we have these very like we move in. Um, we have these. Um, larger, very pleomorphic cells. Um, we already mentioned it being malignant, but just these, you know, a lot of mitoses. Um, I did think I saw um, some kind of donut or horseshoe cells that would point me towards um, like anaplastic large cell lymphoma is what I was thinking for this. Wow. Um, let's see if we can it's find like horse that. Horseshoe cells, tell me a little bit more or about hallmark. it. Yeah, so like the horseshoe nuclei, meaning like more of the hallmark cells. So you're talking about something kind of like this. It's sort of a sign of a poorly differentiated cell with some anaplasia, I guess. Is that what you're referring to here? Uh, yeah, so I feel like they... Okay. What oh, else? That, that, that you're, the diagnosis has to be correct. So tell us a little bit about anaplastic T-cell lymphoma. If you were going to stain this 
for markers, what markers would you do? If you wanted to be a, like a sniper and be very specific, if you felt like 99% sure that's what this is, I'm going to confirm it with one stain. What's the one stain that you would likely put on this? So, you know, it should be CD30 positive, but that doesn't necessarily... Yeah. Isn't that's, completely correct. that's the right answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the right answer to that question. This should be CD30 positive. You're exactly right. right. And then what's another clue that you may be dealing with that entity versus, say, some other type of lymphoma that I'm pointing to right here? Kind of these, this very eosinophilic cells. Yes, very good. Yeah, you get a lot of the eosinophils in this entity. That's very good. So that's actually what this is. Um now, you can get a large cell in a plastic B cell lymphomas or T cell lymphomas. Most of them are, are T. You're right. Mm -hmm. uh, what? So let's talk about the differential diagnosis, however, of the CD30 positive lymphoid neoplasm. So name two or three other things that you have to put in the differential diagnosis if you were to see that something that looks like this histologically with a CD30 positivity with it. Um, like you're saying, like MF or uh, okay, so MF, is all MF have CD30 positive staining? I guess not, <laughs> perhaps no, not. No, it doesn't, okay. it doesn't. You get the CD30 positive transformation, um, in mm -hmm. some cases, mycosis fungoides, which then is a harbinger of a bad prognosis, so you, you obviously don't want to have that. Um, and usually that's seen in, in you know thicker plaque-like lesions and nodules and tumors most of the time. So, but you can see it in MF, in MF that, that's correct. Uh, what are a couple of other things? Probably can the we... most important one to make sure you, you don't miss the diagnosis of. Hodgkin's lymphoma or lympha? Hodgkin's uh... can be positive for CD30. That's correct. It can be positive for CD30. Rarely involves the skin. You know, most Hodgkin's is usually when it spreads it just lymph nodes and it rarely gets into the skin so that's then, that's unusual but yes that's the, the, another answer but what's the most common entity that we see that's cd30 positive in, in uh, lymphoid papillosis lymphoid papillosis good that's the most common one not every single form of lyp is cd30 positive but uh, the vast majority of them are and usually they give you a you know multiple small papules so you wouldn't usually get this large tumor like we have here so this would be more of the large cell anaplastic lymphoma CD30 positive disorder. Now, is there another stain that you can do here on this lesion that would tell you whether it's likely to have a good or bad prognosis? Um, you could do like ALK, see if it's ALK positive or negative. Good, the um, ALK stain, good. So I think, I guess we'd also have to kind of determine whether or not this was uh primary cutaneous or um, I guess METs from the other. Right. Uh, and so yeah. we'll often do the ALK1 stain if it's positive. That sort of tends to mean, I think that it, as I recall, that's the one that tends to be more aggressive. But no. uh, a lot of these in the skin when they're primary cutaneous, they actually go away and they don't actually harm the patient in spite of their very atypical morphology cytologically. So um, it's kind of an interesting thing. In fact, in the old days, a long time ago, well before you were born, used to be called regressing atypical histiocytosis because they would get these very atypical lesions with all these atypical cells in it. And a lot of these just kind of go away and never really harm the patient. So um, it's kind of important to know whether they've really got a systemic disease and they need to be on chemotherapy and be aggressively treated or if it's something that may behave more uh, in a benign fashion, sort of like lymphoma type papulosis. You don't want to overdiagnose that as a lymphoma and treat the patient with you know, chop and aggressive chemotherapy. So, uh, so that's good. All right, very good. That's exactly what this is. Good example of that. I think if they gave you that on the board, they probably would tell you it was CD30 positive. They wouldn't, they wouldn't go through all that. So if you can work through that, you're really in good shape. Thank you. Okay. I can. Um, so for this one, um, looks like a shave biopsy. Um, kind of just from far away, kind of has like a verrucous look to it. Um, but then in the center, um, you can tell that it's um, looks like a benign neoplasm. Good. What part of the body do you think you might be on? Looks like acral skin. Yeah, very good. Excellent. If you just, if you forget this thing for a minute and just look over here, 
It looks great for acral skin. So I'm absolutely correct on that. And Good. then neoplasm, what kind of differentiation? It kind of looked like like fibrous or fibrohistiocytic. Good. So not epithelial. Mm -hmm. It does have epithelial sort of strands here, but we it's I agree. I think it's mostly we're looking at, at this right here. So very good. So we're in the benign epithelial, uh, non-epithelial, and you think fibrohistiocytic. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of going down that differential, um, thinking about like a um, periungual fibroma or acquired digital fibrokeratoma, um, which I thought was a little bit better for the diagnosis because it has the acanthosis um, and the collagen fibers that kind of run like along the long axis. Okay, um, good. What about some of these sort of large sort of plump and kind of irregular cells? Does that cause any heartburn for you or no? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> They're not atypical. I really are not in my toses or anything. There's a little bit of pleomorphism to some of these. And so there's another entity in the same family of lesions that you're talking about, all of which are correct, by the way, uh, so-called pleomorphic fibroma. Um, and occasionally you'll see some of these pleomorphic cells in here, um, and it doesn't really mean anything. It's just another example of, uh, I think this was basically, it would be a nice example, probably of a periungal fibroma, like you mentioned. And I don't think you really would need to be too terribly concerned about distinguishing among those entities for the board examination so much. Um, now, if we saw uh, maybe a little bit more dilated blood vessels here and there, uh, maybe with the rest of the stuff looking kind of similar, uh, is there any syndrome that you would be worried about with periungal fibrotic lesions that look more vascular than this one? Um, I know you can have a, the periungal fibromas with tuberous sclerosis. Yeah. And those are basically angiofibromas. They're analogous to the same lesions that they get on the face. You know, those little adenomasebaceum lesions, quote unquote, those are really angiofibromas. They look a lot like fibrous papules. And you get the same kind of change uh, when you see the biopsy of those lesions around the, the digits. They sort of look like cloves of garlic clinically. And so I think if you saw something like this, you should at least, even though it would look like this, uh, and this doesn't look like a classic angiofibroma, I think you should at least think about the diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis and just make sure the patient doesn't have any other stigmata of it and, and so you just don't miss the diagnosis. But yeah, I think it's a nice example of perineal fibroma. It's got a little bit of slight uh, pleomorphic fibroma-like change. That's one of the reasons we included it here. Um, but this is one of the things that they, they very well could put on a board examination for you as well. All right, very good. We want to something a little different here. Okay, I can do this one. Great. So this one, um, kind of starting at the top and going down, the epidermis to me looks pretty unremarkable. It looks like there's some basal layer hyperpigmentation, but I think most of the action is in the dermis. Yeah, I think you can pretty much just quickly get over, get rid of the epidermis almost immediately. So yeah, it's in the dermis. Now, do you think it's an inflammatory or a neoplastic process? I think it's uh, more inflammatory. Good, excellent. Um, what pattern of inflammation are we looking at here? And it's got a distinctive pattern. Like kind of, um, I guess like maybe like fi kind of spindled, like fibro histiocytic or... That's more of a differentiation. Differentiation, okay. You're going to be correct in that. Um, okay, so, I guess pattern, maybe like um, just superficial and I guess maybe perivascular. There's a little bit of perivascular inflammation here. I agree with you, superficial and maybe even deep. Um, but what about between the blood vessels? Um, it looked like there was a lot of mucin when I was... There is mucin. That's, that's good. And you can see that at low magnification, it's got this pale kind of bluish gray pattern, so a, a color to it, so that's good. But what else? You said there were fibrohistiocytic cells in there. Um, how are they arranged? Um, to me, they look kind of like 
a world pattern um kind of maybe also like would a phrase be like interstitial kind of yes yes that? interstitial which means that they're kind of intercalating between and among the collagen bundles i agree some of them look like they are almost kind of forming little kind of quasi schools of fish if you will some are kind of going up this way some are going this way they're kind of they don't know where they want to go they're sort of splayed between collagen bundles now before we go to higher magnification and this is the educational component of, of this mm -hmm. um what are several diseases that can give you an interstitial mostly pattern at low magnification and then once you kind of have those sort of four or five things in your mind you're going to say well let's go to higher magnification see which one of those it seems to fit best with so the good news about that is there's not 30 there's only mm -hmm. a, about a half a dozen or so so what are some entities that can give you an interstitial mostly pattern of involvement in the dermis yeah, so I was um, thinking kind of like for this quote unquote like busy dermis differential, um, like interstitial GA would be one. That's um, one pattern. Very good. Uh, one thing I was thinking about was also pre, pre um, sclermixedema. Okay, that's um, good. Good enough. Like blue nevus, maybe dermatofibroma. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, those are. You know, that's the one thing about the so-called, quote, busy dermis thing. I mean, you kind of have to, what does that really mean? I mean, you know, is that, you really mean kind of an interstitial mostly pattern where it's sort of splaying of inflammatory or neoplastic cells between the oncology bundles? Or do you mean like a proliferation of a lot of cells in the dermis, like a dermatofibroma, which really doesn't give you that pattern? So it's sort of, uh, I don't know, I don't really use that so much. If I were going to use it, I would think of it almost like busy bees swarming through the dermis, if you will. Okay. So, but you're so far, I think those, those entities you've mentioned so far are good. Now, name a few others that you can see that you should just at least think about when you get an interstitial mostly process. Maybe like um, Kaposi sarcoma. Good. Um, good. Which stage of Kaposi sarcoma? And it's, and it's not Kaposi. It's, okay. it's actually Kaposi, but we most people say Kaposi. It's the, the every, I think every single, I believe it was like, a, I think it was a Turk originally is where Kaposi originally, uh, the, the family lineage originally came from. I think every single one of their, their words is emphasis, the, the accents on the first syllable. <laughs> so that's why you, you call it Kaposi or Kaposi sarcoma. But yes, which stage of, of KS would look like this? I'm, I'm not sure which stage. Okay, good answer. The patch stage. Okay. And sometimes early plaque stage where you get the diffuse interst interstitial involvement of the endothelial cells. They form just, they kind of dissect through the collagen and they're present around the individual blood vessels, the promontory sign. So early KS can definitely look like this. And you can also throw in their angiosarcoma sometimes. That can also give you a pattern that can kind of look a little interstitial mostly. There's a couple of others. What if there's mostly neutrophils as opposed to fibroblast and histiocytes. Um, are you thinking of like sweet syndrome? I'm not sure. That's okay too. That's a good That's answer. Cool. Also, sweets is usually dense diffuse, but cellulitis so, will give you an interstitial, mostly kind of phlegmatous infiltrate. And then whenever you think of cellulitis with neutrophils, always throw in there the other neutrophilic um, inflammatory dermatoses. Those give you a similar pattern. Um, still syndrome, you know, some of those conditions uh, can look like that. And then what if there are some eosinophils plus neutrophils, interstitial mostly pattern? What do you think about? Um, maybe like Wells syndrome? Wells, yeah, Wells can do it, but usually often can be kind of more nodular with flame figures, but urticaria is interstitial mostly as well. These are just things that don't involve the epidermis. They just kind of, the inflammation just diffusely involves the dermis, you know, and that's why you get the wheel, uh, the edematous kind of lesions. And then last of all, metastatic neoplasms, interstitial mostly, breast cancer, the cords and strands of cells there, uh, individually single uh, cell metastases of, of cancers can do this, um, leukemia cutis, interstitial mostly. So it's a relatively small differential, but an important one. And if you know those basic entities in your mind, then you go to higher magnification, start looking at it and make a diagnosis. Now you had a couple of things that were specific. You said there's also mucin in your, so that's going to exclude a lot of things that we just mentioned. So mm -hmm. all the eosinophilic, those go away. 
Um, so of those you mentioned, which are the two most likely to give you this pattern? Um, scleromix edema or the interstitial GA. Good. And of those two, which do you like better here? I like um, scleromix edema better here. Yeah, I do too. I like it a lot better. And it's got, most, notice where the mucin is here. It's diffuse. It's not present in the center of any palisades like you usually see when you get the mucin of GA. And the other thing that's kind of a clue to scleromix edema, if you see it, the fibroblast and histiocytes kind of run north, south, east, and west. I mean, they really are kind of like busy beavers trying to work their way through the dermis here. And they don't know where they're going. They're going from, you know, maybe this guy's going to his his office building over here, this guy's going over here. They're kind of just, just going all over the place here. That's a helpful clue when you're looking at, at scleromix edema. So that's good. Now, what, what other, there's sort of several different forms of this disease. Um, what are the two other, quote, terms, if, in quote, if you will, that, that fall into the same spectrum of scleromix edema? Yeah, so um, the other ones would be uh pretibial mix edema and scleroedema? Well, those are, but I'm talking about in the actual spectrum of scleromix edema, this disease, there's three clinical types and three sort of names for the same process, if you will. Okay. Are you talking about like, there's like lichen? Yes. Mixedema lichen mucinosis and also papular mucinosis. They're all kind of in the same spectrum of this same process here. And if you biopsy them, they pretty much look similar. Some of them have more fibroblast and histocytes, some have fewer, some have more mucin, papular mucinosis variant. And, and then there's also, you obviously need to work this patient up for an underlying paraproteinemia because they almost always have something like that going on with this. Okay, very good, excellent. So that's, that's a good teaching case because you're gonna have to go through that and uh, very well could end up on the board examination as well. Uh, let's try this one. I'm having kind of a hard time hearing you a little bit. What? I can't hear you very well. Um, is it better now? That's better. Yeah, much better. Okay, good. So we've got a shave biopsy. Okay. Yes. Um, and then from this power, it looks like um, there's the sebaceous gland and the dermis, and then the epidermis is, um, there's like loss of reedy ridges. Okay, good. Um, do you think it's an inflammatory or neoplastic process we're dealing with here? I was thinking neoplastic. Okay, good. Um, and what kind of differentiation do you think it's giving you here? Um, I was leaning towards epithelial. Good, good. Uh, any particular type of epithelium? Um, I wasn't sure as of yet. Well, this type of epithelium, right? Yes. This is what you're concerned about here, right? You're not concerned about this or this. Oh. Or... Um, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, that, that would be, be what kind of epithelium is this? Um, squamous? Yeah, yeah, squamous epithelium. It looks like the epidermis. So this is a neoplasm, epidermal mostly neoplasm. Notice how it's just confined to the epidermis. There's really nothing in the dermis. Um, here's normal epidermis over here. Maybe it's not totally normal. I mean, this person's pretty old. They got a lot of sun damage here, so they've kind of lost their epidermal reading, which happens to us as we get older. But we've got this acanthotic epidermis here. So notice how it's thin and suddenly becomes a little bit thick. Okay. Now, did you think this was benign or malignant? I was thinking malignant. Okay. And for what reason? Um, just... Zooming in, um, there's a bunch of those atypical um, blue-gray cells in the, uh, like right under the granular, granular layer. And then I also thought that there was some nuclear pleomorphism and maybe some mitotic figures. It might be a mitotic figure. Well, I'm, it's possible that this could be malignant and it would be pretty early 
malignancy, wouldn't it? They can find it in the epidermis. Tell us about these cells here, though. You mentioned those. Yeah, they just, um, they just look like they have a lot of um, cytoplasm. They're definitely large and atypical um, blue-gray cells. What does that blue-gray imply to you? And that's uh, this is something you I do want you to recognize because this very well could be on the board examination. You know, Jared Gardner has these little things he puts on Twitter, these <laughs> one picture things that says, can you make a one picture diagnosis? He had this on one of his things a few weeks ago that he just showed this image like this basically and said, what is this? So that, and he's, he's kind of right because there, there are certain things that they want you to be able to look at and, and say, ah, that's pathognomonic of this. Like if they show you a multinucleated giant cell of herpes virus infection, they want you to know that's pathognomonic herpes virus infection. They show you molluscum body. They want you to know that. If they show you this, they want you to know what this is. Yeah, it was making me think of um, epidermodysplasia root performance. Good, because that's what it is. I'm glad it made you think that, because that's exactly what this is. This is EDV. Now, a lot of times we'll see this EDV-like change um, coincidentally. So somebody will biopsy what looks like just a they roulette basal cell or they'll you know roulette severi keratosis or something like that, and they'll get something like this. This doesn't always mean that it's really frankly malignant. Um, these lesions are uh, associated with cancer, especially if they have the epidermal dysplasia of Bruce form of syndrome, where they get the uh, inability basically to fight off HPV infection and they get sun related uh, squamous or carcinoma situ that develop an association with these. But yeah, so th this might be an early malignancy developing. The main thing I wanted you to, to diagnose, though, were these bluish gray cells in the epidermis that are the classic EDV-like morphology, because that's something that you very well could see once again on an exam. So that's good. Um, and, you, and you tell us a little bit about EDV. Have you, did you, once you sort of made the diagnosis, did you go back and read up on it a little bit? I did. Um... So basically, um, it's mostly caused by HPV 5 or 8, um, but you can also have a familial variant um, where the patient could be um, have like mutations in the EVER1 and EVER2 genes. Um, and then I guess they would just have um, lots of warts, which become confluent. Yeah, and then you biopsy them and they look like this, and sometimes you biopsy them um, and they look, frankly, like fully developed squamous or carcinoma in situ with full-blown atypia and mitotic figures and the whole ball game. So, yeah. So I don't know if this one, you know, ultimately, well, I, I think this patient may have had this just as a coincidental lesion, but it's a nice example of the morphology of the cells of EDD. So that's great that you you got that. Okay. Let's go to this one here. I can do this one. Okay, great. Um, so it looks like we have a shave here. Um, looks like this is an inflammatory process. Uh, looking at the epidermis, I was trying to tell if this was like pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia or was this just kind of like a weird cut, cut on the slide, but um, I was kind of leaning more towards pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. Um, yeah. There's also like a lot of spongiosis um, and acanthosis in the epidermis. Um, there's um, kind of going in, uh, there's also this like intraepidermal vesicle as well. Um, I felt like there may have been a few dyskeratotic keratinocytes um, too. Okay. Um, and then as far as like the inflammatory cells that are at play here, I saw a ton of eosinophils um, as well as, um, some lymphocytes, maybe a few neutrophils as well. Um, so I, for this one, I was kind of going down the, um, eosinophilic spongiosis, uh, differential. Um, and of that, I was kind of favoring like, um, and conscientia pigmenti versus like a pemphigus vegetans, um, picture. So tell us about how would you distinguish between those two? Yeah, so with um, 
So within conscientia pigmenti, um, you do get like a lot more dyskeratotic keratinocytes versus um, in pemphigoid vegetans, pemphigus vegetans. Um, but in pemphigus vegetans, you'll see the pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. Um, they both have the eosinophilic spongiosis. Um, yeah. In the intelligentia pigmenti, you'll actually see not only dyskeratotic keratinocytes, but you'll actually see little whorls of these mm -hmm. cells they form almost little keratin pearl like, you know, like keratin pearls are like little whorls of, of uh, keratinocytes that are altered because of the Nemo mutation. So they're actually, that's part of the in entity, which you really don't see here. Um, and then up here, you've got a few acantholytic cells here. But I agree that a lot of this is spongiosis, but some of this is, is acantholysis. So that would tend to favor pemphigus vegetans. Mm -hmm. And then you do have, I think I agree with you. I think all of this that we're looking at here is pseudocarcinomatous hyperplasia. It's markedly thickened. So that would favor pemphigus vegetans. The one thing about pemphigus vegetans is if you look at it, it's, it's sometimes difficult to see the acantholysis. You have to look just in some areas because it gets so inflamed with so many eosinophils that it can kind of mask the acantholysis. But if you look here, you can see there's some nice examples, not just of spongiosis, but of true acantholysis. The cells have actually lost the intercellular bridges between them, and they're, they're actually falling free into the small clefts that you see here. So this yeah. is um, what else is in the differential diagnosis of this besides IP and, and that, that you should think about at least? Yeah. Um, so you can also think about like an arthropod um, reaction, acute contact dermatitis. Um, you also think pemphigoid is in the differential, um, herpes gestationis, etox as well, and then drug. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah, I think you're exactly correct. Those that's excellent. So you're in good shape. You know, if you can kind of think of those various things um, when you, you're faced with something like this, you're in very good shape. I think if you were going to try to distinguish among those various entities, obviously this markedly thickened epidermis. Um, you said whether you thought uh, it was cut tangentially or whether it was just really pseudocarcinoma hyperplasia. You've got some areas here where you've got a nice 90 degree section of the epidermis with the cornified layer and and the perikeratosis up there. So that tells you that it is cut at 90 degrees. So this isn't tangentially sectioned or you wouldn't see something like this. So this is all pseudocarcinomatous hyperplasia that you uh, described earlier. Um, anything else about this that, that you should teach us here? How about an infection? Any infectious diseases that could cause this? Um. I'm not sure. What infections are associated with a lot of EOs? Just in general. Like fungal? Can get a lot of EOs with uh, dermatophyte infections, usually not deep mycotic infections. But yes, you can sometimes see tons of EOs in dermatophytes. But what are the most common infectious diseases to give a lot of eosinophils in a biopsy. Parasitic? Yeah, yes, good. Like, you know, scabies, um, helminths, infections, strongyloides. You know, some of those patients get like massive eosinophilia, eosinophilic uh, pneumonia uh, in some of those patients. So yeah, if you get tons of EOs, always think of, of maybe even a parasitic infection. Okay, that's great. Very good. All right. This is another good one. I can do this one. Um, it looks like from from well part, it looks like it's mostly in the dermis. Good. Um, it kind of the first thing that jumps out, it looks like there's a bunch of different nodules, kind of in like a rolls and scrolls kind of appearance. Um, there's a reddish area in the bottom right that looks a little bit like hemorrhage, and lots of dark purple areas that look a little bit like calcifications. Um. So the first thing I thought of was maybe like a calcified. Oh, and whenever you scroll in deeper, um, you the lung power. You like before we go straight to the diagnosis. Um, it, you everything you described is correct, and but back up a second. So do you think it's obviously neoplasm? Correct. Yes. 
And do you think it's benign or malignant? Benign. Yeah. For what reason? Mostly because it looks pretty... Whenever I mostly whenever I zoomed, there didn't seem to be like too much atypia. Well, I don't um, want you to zoom in. I want you to stay out here at low power until it's white <laughs> benign. <laughs> um, There's several really good reasons why it's benign at this power. Because you may scroll into high magnification, see some atypical cells, and say, "Uh oh, you know, maybe I need to change my mind." But <laughs> at least if you look here. If you draw a line right down the middle, we have lost a little bit over here, but is it symmetrical or not symmetrical? Pretty, pretty symmetric, well circumscribed. Excellent. It's it's pretty big. Okay, so it's not small, but it's fairly large, but still it's very symmetrical and it's very well circumscribed. So that favors benign. And you think it's an you think it's probably epithelial, correct? Because you were describing this what we're saying, scrolls and rolls or something like that, I believe. Yes. So I guess you're are those that's a, a sign of epithelial differentiation. No, it, well, this is shape of it looks a little bit like um, whenever you kind of zoom in, um, you have the the in the periphery of some of these nodules, you have some of these like almost epithelial looking cells, and then what looks like keratinization immediately afterwards. So what? So that's a sign of epithelial differentiation. Differentiation, yes. correct? Yes. Yeah, okay, and which which part of the epithelium are we talking about? Maybe like the trichelumal, like the root sheet? Like a hair follicle. Yeah, exactly. And you said trichelumal differentiation. We already had one trichelumal differentiation before, right? Mm -hmm. And we do we have that here again? It looks like it because Yeah, yeah, it looks great. And go ahead and say why. You said because, keep going. Because you have those cells of the periphery, and then you don't really see those ghost cells like you expect in like a pilometricoma. Um, but you do see the clear cells, which yeah. would be more like the internal, you know, the outer layer, that very external root sheath, and you know, kind of beginning from the internal root sheath here with these clear staining cells. So yeah, exactly. So this is this is so-called trichelumal differentiation, and here you've actually got cornification that's forming. And you're right, there is some calcification in here. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's take a look around here. We saw, I thought I saw a mitotic figure. Should we start calling the oncologist to get the patient ready for chemotherapy? Or what do you think? Let them have a free weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a couple of mitoses. Are we going to change our mind here and call this a cancer? No. No. And why not? Because even though you can have, you can see a few mitosis, I think for the most part it looks fairly benign. Yeah, and it's also the stem cells, the basaloid proliferative germinative cells of, of the lesion like this, of a sebaceous lesion. Uh, those lesions, so you know, they're they're rapidly proliferating. They're like the hair bulb cells, if you will. And so when patients get chemotherapy, their hair bulb cells get they get killed because they're rapidly uh, proliferating. And so that's why you get alopecia with chemotherapy. So you, you can get mitotic figures, and usually they're going to be bipolar. They're not going to be very atypical. Um, so yeah, if you see a few mitotic figures, that doesn't mean anything. So what's the diagnosis here? Uh, calcified proliferating pilar cyst. Yeah, yeah, or proliferating uh, trichelumal tumor is another name for this lesion. Um, now, what is the pitfall that we commonly encounter in this lesion? that dermatopathologists often have to struggle with a little bit here. So your answer is correct with the diagnosis. But now we're talking about a more practical situation. This actually was presented at the Texas Durham meeting, interestingly enough. You, you guys were there, I think, some of you. Um, remember that young woman that had these multiple lesions like this and been present since she was about, I think, birth. Or uh, maybe certainly she had it since she was five years old, and then she had lots of lesions that developed over the course of time. And they biopsied a couple of lesions, and you know they saw some dyskeratotic cells and maybe a couple of mitotic figures, and they called them cancer. So are we going to call this cancer just because there's a couple of mitotic figures and a couple of dyskeratotic keratinocytes when the overall lesion looks like this? No, I guess he could also be mistaken as like a trichelumal carcinoma. Yeah, yeah, that's they get overcalled as cancer all the time, and they're not cancer. 
And, you know, you don't want to diagnose a cancer in a young person. Now, that lady was a different ball game. She had lots of these lesions that have been present for many years. And if you do leave these lesions alone for 25, 30 years, they can undergo malignant degeneration in some cases. Not, it's not common, but they can undergo malignant degeneration. The most important thing is that you just don't look at this and say, oh, my goodness, there's all these you know, bulbous aggregations of cells or some mitotic figures, therefore it's cancer. When you look at a low magnification, it's got all the architectural features of benign lesion. So, you know, this is totally not cancer. It's it's completely benign. There's nothing to worry about. And you just want to make sure that it, it doesn't get overcalled as cancer because it's got this pseudoepithelioma, this proliferation of all these cells, just like the Pempicus vegetans case. You don't want to overcall that cancer when it's got pseudocarcinoma to hyperplasia either. Um, I've seen that happen before. In fact, there's a a, a tragic case of a woman that had pemphigus of the, of the cervix a number of years ago that got called cancer. She was in her 20s and it was pemphigus and they did a hysterectomy on her for that. And unfortunately, then she couldn't have kids anymore. So it led to a lawsuit. So you want to make sure that you don't overcall things as cancer when they're not cancer either. So that's a nice example of a so-called proliferating tricholemal cyst or proliferating tricholemal tumor. Okay, the last one here, fortunately, the, it's a real world sort of situation, but. Uh, Good morning. What? Um, uh, this is Danny. Yes, t tons of things were going on. Um, so this is a shave um, at low power. I was able to notice um, some inflammation in the dermis. Okay, good. Do you think it's an inflammatory or neoplastic process? I favored inflammatory in this case. Okay, good. And so let's just, we're going to, we're going to uh, advance you now from a resident to an attending. Wonderful. And the resident does this, what are you going to say to them? You say, good job. Or you can say, if you do this again, I'm going to take out this wet noodle and give you 50 lashes with it. I would have hoped to see a little bit deeper. Um, yes. Wouldn't say. it have been nice? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be wouldn't have been great if they would have been kind enough to give us a punch biopsy of this. Um, sadly enough, we're getting more and more shave biopsies of inflammatory skin conditions. And you know, I, good old Dr. Ackerman would be turning over in his grave because when he's using you're using pattern analysis, you you assess whether something is superficial and deep or not. And if you get a shave, you're doomed. Mm. We can't tell deep, so we can. You know, this would have been very nice to get a the biopsy to see how deep this inflammation goes. So you're exactly right. This is a, a poor shave biopsy of inflammatory skin disease. Please don't do that. Take a nice punch biopsy so we can evaluate the depth and apply the pattern recognition method to this appropriately. But since we have one arm tied behind our back, we're still going to go ahead and see if we can make a definitive diagnosis here. Agreed. Um... I also, so thank you for sharing that point, but also notice some things were abnormal about the epidermis in this case, though. Yeah, you do notice that. So let's, so what's the pattern in the dermis that we do have? Okay, so here there's, I was between like perivascular or lichenoid, just like it's close to the papillary. Excellent. It's got some perivascular inflammation and it goes to the mid reticular dermis, which is all we have. It might have gone deeper. We don't know. And then there's also some involvement of the interface. I totally agree with you. So that's yeah. a helpful yeah. finding when you see uh, both dermal inflammation as well as interface involvement. Right. Good. And it was now, what kind of cells are these mostly here? Lymphocytes. Good. Lymphocytes. Excellent. A little higher magnification. And mm -hmm said that the epidermis was abnormal. Tell us what's wrong with the epidermis. Okay, so there is um, a component, there's some spongiosis, but there's also like little vacuoles and little bubbles. Good, good, excellent. I, and, I, and that's very good. If you say there are bubbles there, <laughs> that means you're seeing round holes, that, that's good. You see that, then you say bubbles equals vacuolar alteration. Right, so there's some interface dermatitis there for sure. And we'll go to a little higher magnification. What about the cornified layer? Is that a normal cornified layer? No, it's not. There's uh, parakeratosis, so retained nuclei. Um, Is there any pattern to that parakeratosis that's distinctive? 
interesting. Is there a pattern? <laughs> um, so, so far the patterns I've learned are like mounds of perikeratosis. Good, excellent, very good. Is that what this is? No, it's not. It's typically a smaller. Oh. Good, yes, excellent. Good that you, good that you have. What's what's another pattern that you may have learned so far? Um, sometimes the perikeratosis can be around the hair follicle, like shoulder. Um, and sometimes... What's the disease that gives you that, by the way? Uh, so the first one was pityriasis rosea and that, that, or a subderm um, for that. Yeah, subderm, that shoulder perikeratosis, exactly. But what about this perikeratosis? What do you notice about this one here? I um, don't know what to say. <laughs> it's kind of confluence perikeratosis. So okay. it's, kind of, it's not really in these little mounds like that. It's It's more kind of in a broad confluent zone confined right to this area where the inflammation is localized. Um, this is probably a pretty acute lesion because it still has basket weed cornified layer on top of it. Usually by the time we get this a biopsy of this, it's pretty crusty and you don't really see the basket weed cornified layer. So this actually, believe it or not, wouldn't have even been all that scaly yet. You know, maybe in another day it, it would have been, this would have sloughed off, but it's more of a confluent perikeratosis. And look at higher magnification, there's also some other cells in this kind of confluent perikeratosis here. Yes. What's that here? They're little ant-like neutrophils. Good, ant-like, I like that too. I hadn't heard that one before. You learn something new every day. So ant-like <laughs> cells are equal neutrophils. Okay, good. And so we've got this confluent perikeratosis with neutrophils. What do we call it when we get perikeratosis plus neutrophils? What's that actually called, that sort of combination phenomenon there? Perikeratosis plus neutrophils. I mean, I, you know it, but it, it, it's not gonna probably pop into your mind. It's sort of like a crossword puzzle. Is it two like, words or one word? <laughs> I mean, how hyphenated term word actually. Oh, then I uh I don't know. My guess would have been like neutrophilic perikeratosis, but that's not that's not we call it scale crust, if you will, because it means it's got some crusting in there with the neutrophils and the serum, and then this is the scale. So when you see with the perikeratosis plus neutrophils and some serum, that's scale crust. So clinically, when you see these, it's mm -hmm. not gonna look like the cornified layer of psoriasis, the micaceous scale of psoriasis. This is going to be crusty. You know, it's going to look almost scabby, if you will, a little, a little different. It's going to feel different also. Okay, so good. So let's take a look at that epidermis. What about the inflammation up here, the papillary? Any other? So here we've got neutrophils up here. We have yeah. lymphocytes down here. What red, else do we have? Red blood cells. Yeah, I've got our extravasated erythrocytes. And then let's look at the epidermis up here. We're going to see a few other kind of things that are going to be helpful for us. What are these structures right here? Mm -hmm. This and this. Oh, yeah. Those more eosinophilic kind of bigger cells. I thought those were um, dyskeratotic keratinocytes. Good. You thought exactly correct. Very good. So what's the diagnosis? So this is, I believe, pityriasis lichenoides. Um, good. Good. Yes. You're exactly right. Pityriasis lichenoides. Do we know what form of pityriasis lichenoides it is? I think it's the um, pleva. I think it's more more acute and more the acute form. I would agree with you. Although you can get patients that have pityriasis lichenoides chronica for years, and you biopsy a, a relatively newly developing lesion that can look like this, so you can get the relatively acute lesions um, in patients that have chronic disease. So. What I do in these, I'll just often just sign them out as pityriasis lichenoides in general, because I don't know how long the patients had the eruption clinically. I don't know what they look like. But yeah, this is a histologic perspective, classic for pityriasis lichenoides. Now, there's one form that um, can give you a really severe, with lots of ballooning degeneration and um, acanthosis and lots of scale crust and lots of inflammation, really, really dense inflammatory part that really... Uh, looks like uh, pleva, the so-called Mucha Haberman type of children that can be really, really sick and have fever and end up in the hospital. Um, this isn't really that form, so this is probably in that spectrum, but it's not really not that really severe florid form that you see there. Now, if we look in the dermis here, and we're going to look really hard, what cell will we not see in this condition? We won't see eosinophils. Very, very good. Yeah, if you see EOs in this pattern, you want to pull back 
on the diagnosis. If we were to see EOs, and it looks a lot like this, what might the diagnosis be that's usually in the clinical differential of this? Oh, I don't know about the clinical differential, but you can always see a, a, a drug reaction with these symptoms. <laughs> Drugs can do anything. So yeah, if you were to see like a pitoriasis lichenoides like histology with EOs, you say maybe this is a PLC-like drug eruption or something like that. So that's a good idea. But what else? It clinically can look very much like pitoriasis lichenoides, papules, mm -hmm. superficial crust, and sometimes some you know, epidermal necrosis. And then you biopsy it and it's got an interface dermatitis and it's got some eosinophils in it and some atypical lymphoid cells in it. Oh gosh, I think this is where I start needing help. <laughs> well, what if you did a CD30 stain and it was positive? Okay, well, lymph Lymphoma look a lot like pitoriasis lichenoides, both clinically and histologically. And as you know, I think there may be up to the G form of, pitor of the lymphoma papulosis now. <laughs> before, the, before they're done, they'll be at Z. It will get all the way through the letters of the alphabet. But in any event, you could, it can look similar clinically and histologically. So that's something to think about. What if we saw a few plasma cells in here? Would that change our diagnosis? I I only recall plasma cells in the setting of syphilis. Well, you can see plasma cells um, rarely in pitoriasis lichenoides, but if you were to see a pitoriasis lichenoides like eruption with a fair number of plasma cells in it, yes, you should definitely think of syphilis. And I, I there's a case I remember back from when I was a resident that was diagnosed in a 50-some-odd-year-old woman that lived in Park Avenue. And it was diagnosed as pitoriasis lichenoides. And they kept calling her that over and over again. And it never got better with therapy. And finally, one of the residents that I was actually in training with suggested to the clinician who brought the patient to the conference, have you checked the VDRL on the patient? <laughs> and guess what? It was syphilis. Oh, and the lady and her husband had brought it back home. And the biopsy looked almost exactly like this with wow. some plasma cells in it. So you should always at least keep syphilis in the back of your mind and just about anything. And it can look very much like pitoriasis lichenoides um, histologically. So syphilis can really can do just about anything under the sun. So absolutely. So good. Yeah, it would have been nice to get a deeper biopsy and we probably would have seen a deeper infiltrate going all, all down there. That That's a, they're very good that you were able to get that diagnosis on a shade biopsy. Thank okay, you. we got through everything today. Good job, everybody. Um, this is recorded for those who want to look at it later on. And uh, we will see you guys next month. Thank you, Dr. Cockrell. You're welcome.